Right, so my talk is uh, are all BSDs created equally, a survey of BSD kernel vulnerabilities. Um, so who am I? My name is Ilya van Sprundel. Um, I uh, work at IOActive. I'm their director of penetration testing. Uh, I do pen test, quote review, and I break stuff for fun and profit, basically. And then it's somebody else's job to go and fix it. <laughs> um, so my outline is sort of really easy. I have a one slide introduction that sort of puts something out there, and then I try to collect some data. Uh, which is essentially vulnerabilities over the years in uh, BSD or BSD, BSD kernels, and then sort of lacking more than what I want, um, I sort of do this sort of test by audit, and then basically um, I sort of run through some uh, common attack surface and some issues I found, uh, and then I sort of uh, lay out some results and draw a couple of conclusions. Um, so what's this talk about, right, BSD kernel vulnerabilities? A comparison between different BSD flavors. Um, the audience, I think, should be self, pretty self-explanatory, right? If you're a low-level security guy or you're a Unix or BSD geek, or if you're a Linux guy, you might enjoy it too. Um, or people generally curious about, you know, low-level OS internals, I think they might enjoy this. Um, as far as knowledge goes, um, I, I mean, I do expect that you have some basic understanding of the BSD kernel. Uh, doesn't have to be too deep, but just general concepts would be nice. Um, yeah, before I want to continue, um, this is not just, I didn't just create this out of the thin air. Um, there was work by others that I've uh, uh, sort of relied upon and sort of that came before me. Um, and I'm sure I forgot some because you always do. Uh, if you feel like you should be on the list and you're not, I'm, I'm the only guy at fault here. Um, but most of the, all of these guys have basically had contributions at some level in, in sort of the uh, offensive BSD kernel stuff. So this is my entire intro. It's basically a small rant by Theo Drat, um from about 12 years ago um, where he gave some Forbes uh, magazine interview about the Linux guys and how they suck. Um, and he follows up with some... Uh, some uh, um, some post online and he goes, uh, well, you know, if the Linux people actually cared about code quality as we do, uh, they wouldn't have had as many, you know, local kernel holes in the last year. And he goes, how many has it been, like 20 so far? Right? That's the entire slide. Um, and now that thing is 12 years old, but somehow that's been stuck in my head. I've never gotten it out. And I've been like, well, you know, is that, is that really true? Like, can you back that up? Um, and so I went look for, looking for some data. And sure enough, most of these things have CVs, um, and there's a website that collects them all. And you basically go there and say, please show me all Linux vulnerabilities, and it gives you this beautiful grid, and it says these are all the bugs per year, types of bugs, all that type of stuff. Um, and so if you look at this thing, you, you sort of see, you know, from 99 till 2007, um, and this, 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 this grid is actually slightly older. This is from... Uh, about three weeks ago, the numbers for 2017 aren't quite right. It says 346 there, but it's really today, it's 353. That's the number of Linux kernel vulnerabilities this year, right? Um, but if you start looking at the, at the at sort of the, bot, the, the top, 99 till about 2003, you know, the numbers were pretty mild, right? It was like, oh, you know, five or anywhere between five and 20-ish, right? So that, and then, and then sort of as of uh, 2004, it kind of sort of, you know, it gets sort of hockey stick that goes on, right? Um, so the numbers basically get worse and worse and worse. More and more security vulnerabilities discovered and disclosed every year in Linux kernel, essentially, right? So now what do those numbers look like for the BSDs? Well, I went to cvdetails.com and I said, uh, you know, open BSD kernel vulnerabilities and zilch. It says net BSD kernel vulnerabilities, nothing. Free BSD kernel vulnerabilities, zero. Well, I know that's not true. Um, I've had some, reports some before, they should have at least shown up. Um, but I do know they publish their own advisories. Um, and I guess the case of open BSD, it's like, it's Narata. Um, and it's, it's essentially the same thing, except it's uh, much shittier to part, get data out of. Um, so I spent like an evening writing some uh, a web crawler and some shitty protocol that parses HTML, and then like fuck around in Excel to get the numbers lined up. Um, but I did that, and so you sort of, you know, build a similar-ish table, um, and you'll see that the the numbers from 1999 till about 2003, more or less, are in the same ballpark as Linux. Um, and then you know Linux after 2003 kind of you know goes like this, 
but then Ulta B has these kind of sort of stay the same. I mean, it's it more or less line up, goes up, goes down a bit. It's usually anywhere between zero and like 20 or something. Um, and, and that hasn't changed. So if you look at numbers even for this year, they're more or less in line. Um, so looking at these numbers, um, Dio was right, you know. The Linux guys are doing a lot worse than the BSD guys, right? A very astute observation. Um, and when he said uh, 20, 2005, um, that was, you know, a, a very conservative view. If you look at the table here, it's 133, not 20. <laughs> so, you know, he was, uh, he was off, but uh, the, his, his sort of, uh, the impression he wanted to give seems to sound right. Um, but then I wonder, well, you know, if we see this kind of hockey stick um, in Linux numbers, why don't we see them in the BSD numbers, right? Is it really true? Is it, is it, is it code quality? Is that what it is? And so I want to sort of, in my presentation, I want to, I want to basically figure out, okay, are these numbers on equal footing? Are, are the Linux guys doing something different? Or is everything else the same? And it's all about code quality. Um, and so when I was talk, thinking about this, I said, well, you know, there, there's, you know, this, uh, this many eyeballs thing, right? And, and, and I know, I know, because it's, many eyeballs thing is mostly like, you know, this sort of, it's not really true. And of course, not all bugs are shallow. No matter how many people you have looking at code, some bugs are just ridiculously hard to find. Um, but the general idea behind the many eyeballs thing I do like. And so I'm, I'm thinking, is there some truth to it? Because um, surely there are more eyes looking at Linux kernel code than there are OpenBSD just by sheer number, right? Um, and so I want to figure out if, that's, if, that has, if that has remotely anything to do with, with this. Okay. So um, first of all, I, I sort of looked around and, and sort of, has anybody else done this before? Right? Because the way you would do this is you go and look for vulnerabilities in these things and see what the numbers are. Um, and it turns out somebody did that um, 15 years ago. Um, it's a, 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 a very, very nice Australian guy named um, Silvio. And he did a, um, he did a blackout presentation about this. Um, and, and I vaguely remember this, and I looked up the slides, and I'm like, oh, this is, you know, you get this nostalgia, you look at this again, and you're like, oh, these slides are so fucking awesome. Um, and then you start looking at them, and then, and then sort of get to the last three or four conclusion slides, and um, Sylvia basically goes, well, you know, there's really not that much of a quality difference between the BSDs and the Linux in terms of security. Um, now, that was over a decade ago, it was 15 years ago. So have things changed, right? The, the, his conclusions are three years before uh, Tio's rant, so things may have changed in those 15 years, right? Um, the time spent um, in the slides compared between BSD and Linux is like he spent like a week on all the BSDs combined and then like three months on Linux, right? So the, even, even like there, that's apples and oranges, right? And then the last one is sort of the, um, uh, Silvio basically put out this, okay, I'm gonna go look for trivial image overflows and some info leaks, and, and so that's kind of it, right? And so what I want to do is I was like, I don't want to limit myself to just those two. I want to be a little bit wider and then see if I can find some other stuff as well and, and how easy those things are to find. Um, so I sort of set, set out and said, okay, I'll go do the same thing Silvio did just 15 years later. Um, so I spend uh, April, May, June, and a little bit of July um, auditing BSD source code. Um, and when I set out to do this, I was like, okay, well, um, where, where do I think the bugs are? Where would they be, right? What's, what's the interesting attack surface, right? Um, and so you come up with this sort of short list of, you know, where I think they are, right? Number one, I mean, it's, it's stuff where a user can talk to it, essentially, right? So number one is system calls, right? Users are going to have to talk to kernel and they're going to have to do it through system calls, right? Uh, number two is obviously your GCP IP stack, right? If you're network connected, <coughs> someone's going to be sending you packets at some point, so that's attack surface. And so that's sort of the super common, that's the one that, you know, my, my mom could come up with those. And then I sort of build a list that are like slightly less common to like, <clears throat> to like you know, sort of rare-ish or exotic or something, right? Um, and so at the top of the list is sort of the drivers and specifically, you know, ioctals, because, um, you know, most devices need someone to talk to it and configure it and get data out of it. Um, <clears throat> and then sort of, uh, I started thinking a bit more and I was like, oh, well, these BS BSDs, um, most of them, you know, it comes with these compat layers. Um, that's probably interesting to go and find, look for bugs. Um, and then um, I was doing something else where I had this idea that, I, that I'll talk about in a second. And based upon that, I was like, oh, you know, the, um, the trap handlers are probably interesting too. And this is where it gets sort of a little bit more and more esoteric. And then it's sort of the, okay, 
well, what about file systems? And it turns out there's some attack surfaces in file systems as well. And then I'm like, okay, well, there's also networking that isn't um, TCP IP stack. Like, you know, Wi Fi. I mean, it, it kind of ties into it, but it's really, I mean, it's not, you know, you open up TCP IP Illustrator, it doesn't talk about, you know, uh, um, uh, Wi Fi frames, right? Um, and then there's other things like Bluetooth and URDA, um, and I wanted to cover those too, but I ran out of time, so I'll just, in that section, I'll only talk about the Wi Fi stack. Um, and then I was like, okay, let's just dive right in, and what I'm going to do is, I'll sort of um, have a little slide that sort of introduces the thing, and then I'll show you a little bit of code of a, of a bug, and I'll de describe the bug, and for four or five of them, I'll basically run through a little bit of a demo. <coughs> so let's uh, <coughs> start off with syscalls. Obvious attack surface, right? Um, it is exactly how the user talks uh, to the kernel. Um, without system calls, your OS would be essentially useless. Um, since the BSDs have, you know, evolved since the 70s, um, they no longer have 40 or 50 system calls, they, they, they number in the hundreds, uh, and they do all sorts of funky stuff and performance improvements. Um, and these, I mean, the, essentially these are things like, you know, open a file, read a file, you know, create a network connection, send, read something from a network connection, close a file, you know, send a message, get my UID, that, that's the kind of stuff it does, right? Um, and so FreeBSD is at the top of the list, they have like 550-ish, and then uh, um, NetBSD is slightly below it with 480, and then at the bottom is like um, OpenBSD, uh, they only have 330 system calls. Um, and functionality-wise, you might say, okay, well, you want to have more rather than less because that, you know, have more functionality, and while that may be true, from a security perspective, the less system calls, the better, right? Because um, no, less system calls means less attack surface means more security, right? Um, so just looking at these numbers, you go like, oh, go open BSD, right? Um, and then I, one of my assumptions is basically that, well, given that there's such obvious attack surface and they're so well tested and they're constantly used by apps, this is probably, you know, less likely to contain security bugs, right? <laughs> and so let me show some code. So that's a system call. This one basically, you know, drops a, sy a syslog message, right? And it takes a buffer and it takes a length and it, takes your buffer and your length and it passes it on to this function called do sense uh, syslog. And do sense syslog basically takes the length field and then basically puts it in a, um, in an uh, uh, IO structure and then from there it sort of takes out the length, the length field again and then passes that along to uh, the kernel malloc function. Um, now the kernel malloc function is sort of, um, historically in BSDs it was very special. Um, the FreeBSD and IBSD have sort of evolved away from that. Um, but OpenBSD still has the original model where um, malloc basically goes and says, if your length is too big, um, you're doing something really horrible, and instead of just hanging your system, I'm going to crap out um, and basically panic. And then it, it looks like this. Your system is essentially dead after you do this. Um, and so essentially this is the, uh, it's, a, it's an unbound malloc in OpenBSD um, that triggers a kernel panic. Um, and it's, it's easily triggerable through the census lock system call. And let me see if I can, man, I, can, I really can't see that. Hold on. That's not it. What? One more? Uh, this guy? There you go, okay. So that's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I seriously, I can't see it because my screen is different than what's there. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so that should tell you the U name that it's NetBSD, uh, OpenBSD, sorry, right? Yes, yes. And I, I pre-compiled the syslog binary, um, and I will be throwing the source code for that out after my talk. Um, I just don't know where yet. Um, but if you if you want to figure out where it is, uh, shoot me an email and I'll tell you. So if we run this thing, boom, there you go. Right there, that's a kernel panic. The box is dead. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> okay, hold on. Yeah, that looks about right. Okay, so that definitely triggers a kernel panic, right? Okay, let's uh, do not, let's look at a not system call because we don't have just one look at OpenBSD, right? So this is a system call called KLD stat, which is um, 
uh, in uh, uh, FreeBSD, and basically, it basically you call a system call and you say, "Hey, give me uh, um, a list of loaded drivers, or for that particular driver, tell me everything you know about it." And sort of this system call goes back and says, "Here's what I got." And the way that works is um, it calls a thing called copy in, which takes the data from the user, and then calls current KLD stat, and it basically collects a bunch of data and puts it in the structure called the stat structure. Um, and I don't have to function for um, KLD stat in here because I didn't want to spoil, I didn't want to like pollute um, the slide. But essentially what this function does is it fills out two strings uh, that can be about a thousand bytes long. Um, and it sort of um, copies a null rate string into it. Uh, but then everything else after no byte is never initialized. So you basically end up with about a half a page worth of info leak stuff. Just data that's um, on the stack, never initialized, right? Um, <coughs> this is in uh, FreeBSD 11, is when I, when I looked at it. Went back and saw that this bug has been around for eh, more or less about a decade. Um, so <coughs> let me see if I can demo that too. Oh yeah, this works better. I think that one's right, yes. So this basically um, triggers the bug over and over and over and what you're gonna see is like a long stream of like random kernel bytes. Um, actually, hold on. Boom, there you go. All that stuff is, that's all, you're leaking and you're leaking and you're leaking. Yeah, there's some weird bug where sometimes it hangs, but it basically just keeps leaking and leaking and leaking and leaking, and that's endless amounts of undersized kernel memory. Um, I was thinking of doing a demo where I grabbed some stuff out of it, um, but I didn't, um, ran out of time. Oh, yeah. Um, Um, <clears throat> so now that I've seen two of these bugs, um, and I have several, several more uh, syscall bugs. I uh, didn't want to spend all my time just demoing those, those things. Um, but essentially, you know, the previous assumption where we go, oh, well, you know, these things are well tested, they've been around forever, it's highly likely they have bugs. Well, that's not really true. Turns out, bugs do occur in system calls with some regularity, um, and particularly newly added system calls, right? Um, that do sense this lock thing has only been around for one version. Um, the KLD one happens to be, happens to have been around for a decade. Um, there's a bunch of others like, um, uh, I, have a, I have a bunch of other like FreeBSD ones, um, like, you know, that show up. Um, so, you know, the, the assumption is, isn't really true. Like, if you just assume syscalls won't have bugs, well, that, it just isn't true. Okay, so let's move on to the CIP stack, right? Hopefully, presumably, everybody knows um, uh, what that is and what that means. Um, it, you know, it handles networks, you know, lo <clears throat> the low level stuff, IPv4 and 6, and UDP and TCP and the sequence numbers and, you know, IPsec and how it all ties together and then how you route it back and forth to use land app and those kind of things. Um, this is obviously very well known attack surface. <clears throat> it's been around forever. Again, the same assumption here is that this is very well tested code. It's been around since the early 80s. Uh, very unlikely to find security bugs in there. All right. So here's another piece of uh, OpenBSD code. This basically takes uh, PP over internet packets and sort of passes it on to this, to this handler and it sort of loops over the, the packet data and it looks for a tag in a length. When it finds a tag in a length, it goes into the switch and the switch goes, oh, hey, this tag, this tag, this tag. In this particular case, there's a, um, an error, <coughs> some error tag, in this case, I guess, S name error. And it basically goes there and says, okay, let's set message, error message to this, and then set a flag that says error tag, and then end of the uh, switch case, you kind of, there's this code that kind of goes, oh, hey, if we got this particular error message, go in and, and, and go do this. And then um, they basically pull out the thing out of the packet. Uh, I mean, before they can actually touch the bytes, and this is, this is like a bizarre, um, uh, uh, they have these things called mbuffs, which are basically very specific buffer structures that are designed to hold network data, right? And there's all sorts of APIs around them to work with them, and so they're, they're made in a way so you can chain it together so that if you wanna like append or prepend or like swatch, uh, switch stuff out as you're building a packet, that, that they work, right? 
Uh, and as part of that, um, before you ever touch any of these things, um, you, you, you're not guaranteed to have a continuous buffer, right? Um, and so there's a function called pull down, and basically what, what pull down does is it says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all of these things chained together, um, and when I successfully, when I, when, when I complete and, I'm, and it's successful, I'm going to hand you back, you know, a buffer that is completely continuous, and you can start using that, right? And so it does that, um, and if that works, it goes on and does what it's supposed to do. Now if that fails, it bails out. Um, and it basically goes to this thing called done, and the done basically goes, says, oh yeah, this is your original uh, mbuff, let's go and free that thing, right? Um, and so that code looks fine, except if you look at the man page for pull down, um, it says uh, in the fine print, it goes, well, if pull down fails, it frees the mbuff, and then it tells you it failed. Um, so what's happening here basically is if the pull down fails, the mbuff is freed, and then it goes and frees the mbuff again, right? So, uh, uh, sorry. Um, so a, a, a pretty trivial case of, um, you know, double free. Um, this isn't, oh, I found an OBD 611, it turns out it's been there um, for a decade and change. Um, and then um, one of the things I did is I tried to cross-reference, because they do have a fair amount of shared code, so I tried to cross-reference, um, and I looked at the NetBSD code base and I saw that in February of this year, they discovered this bug independently and they fixed it, but um, there was never an announcement made, it was silently fixed. Um, <laughs> And so again, the, the previous assumption that this is well-tested code and it's highly unlikely there's a bug in there, well, that isn't really true. It's, I mean, it, while this is well-tested code, it'll still have bugs. Um, and the other thing I discovered is that, um, so these M buffs are incredibly complicated and it's very error-prone, right? To, to, to do it right and to never make a mistake, it's kind of hard. And one of the things is that um, a lot of the APIs to sort of handle these things, um, it depends on their failure cases. So about half of them basically go and say, okay, if I fail, I don't free this buffer. And the other half go, if I fail, I'm gonna go free these buffers, right? And so that creates this inconsistency where if you're a developer, right, and you're, uh, you assume the API uh, uh, um, freeze on failure, um, and so uh, you basically say, okay, I'm not gonna freeze this thing because it frees on failure, but if the API really doesn't free on failure, then you leak your memory. And then the opposite occur occurs too, right? Where if you go and say, okay, I'm pretty sure it's API on return, on failure doesn't free, I'll go free it, you know it's double free. So this, this sort of, you know, inconsistency among API behavior um, uh, combined with the complexity of, of the MBuff structure sort of creates this um, situation where, like, it's pretty damn hard to get things right every time. Right. <clears throat> so let's move on to drivers, right? IOctals, you know, everybody's favorite hack surface. Um, you know, lots and lots of drivers are out there. Um, BSEs are no different. Um, they have piles and piles of drivers for all sorts of stuff. Um, and, you know, obviously BSE is a Unix, and in Unix, you know, everything is a file. So the way you expose a device to user land is you put it in slash dev, right? And you give it some name. And obviously these things basically expose file operations to user land, right? Like file and open and read and write and ioctl and things like that. And I guess you can map some of them too, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, IOCTL obviously is where you have a tax surface. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at an IOCTL, right? So um, NetBSD has this device called Crypto. Um, and basically what Crypto does is um, it takes uh, 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 an IOCTL input and actually, um, anyway, it takes an IOCTL input and it basically goes and says, okay, well, here's, uh, here's some structure that comes from user land and it contains this, uh, this count field and what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an array of number of count fields, um, and then we're gonna start running data into it, right? And then we're gonna start using it, and we're gonna start, like, manipulating stuff. Um, and as, as you can see, there's a count time size of the structure, um, and anybody who knows anything about writing code and security knows that that is a very classic integer overflow. Um, <clears throat> right, that's an integer overflow right there. And that's your memory corruption bug right here. The, I didn't, again, I didn't want to put more code on the slide because it would just pollute things, but that crypto dev M key stuff is basically, you know, starts uh, 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 writing stuff to, to that buffer that was previously allocated. Um, so, yeah, that's a uh, 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 classic integer overflow leads to memory corruption. Um, it's in NetBSD. It has been there uh, about nine-ish years. 
Um, and then, hold on, let me see. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's. Oh, yeah. So this is basically, hopefully, fingers crossed, going to trigger the um, integer flow and then cause memory corruption and it'll basically trap into the debugger. There you go. Boom. It's done. It's gone. Memory corrupted, rebooted. <clears throat> so here's another one. This is a uh, uh, this is a uh, um, this is a, a device on FreeBSD called KSIMS, which basically gives you the ability to expose kernel symbols to user land, right? Um, and it basically, as I mentioned earlier, most of these drivers have an open callback, and this one's no different. And when you uh, when you call the open system call, it goes to this callback, and the callback basically sets up a few things so you can later do operations on it, and then it returns successfully. Uh, one of the things it does in this case is basically. Um, so it creates um, a file descriptor storage specific private data, which means there is kernel private data associated with the file descriptor you're going to use in user land. Um, in this particular case, what they do is um, they uh, uh, look at the pointer to your, uh, um, that basically contains all the data needed to describe your virtual address space for your, for your process and stores it in that pointer. Or, or yeah, inside that uh, driver specific um, uh, 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 storage. Um, and then basically it returns successfully. And then um, later on, there's another system call that basically gets called if you do an MMAP in that particular file descriptor. Um, and as you can see, it references um, that particular pointer that was previously saved, right? That um, SCP map is saved here and it's referenced here, right? Okay. So the bug here is that uh, um, uh, the pointer used in MMAP doesn't necessarily still have to be valid than the one used in open. Right, and so the way that works is, because um, usually you say, okay, well, the file script is associated with the process, and so as long as the process is around, the file script will be around, and so that virtual address space map will still be around. Except, you know, OpenBSD, uh, or at least the BSDs and Unix in general, is smarter than that, and it gives you the option to basically not just hold on to a file script, but instead go to a different process and say, hey, you can now have this file script too, and then once that guy has the file script, you can say to the original process, okay, well, you go and die. So the original process is gone, and so all data associated with it is entirely gone and expired. And now you have that second process, and that second process is still holding on to the file descriptor, and all of a sudden it says, oh, well, now sounds like a good time to call MAP on this thing. And MAP goes around and says, oh, look, I have, this, I have all these pointers to uh, this particular process, this virtual memory uh, space, um, and it goes and reference that. So there's, there's all sorts of things with that except the original process is gone, it's dead, it's entirely expired, um, and so this guy um, ends up, if you do that, you know, it ends up doing really, really horrible things. Um, and I would love to demo this, but, um, well, I have a POC, because it's, it's a shitty race to hit. Uh, this one took me a couple of days to hit. Um, I, don't have that, I don't have that long um, to show you. Um, I will be releasing code, um, so if you want to play, play around with this, uh, you can. Uh, for now, you, you'll have to do with a screenshot of a kernel panic. <clears throat> okay, so that's it for the sort of super common attack surface. Uh, so the compact code is not a one where it's like, okay, this is interesting uh, attack surface. Um, and so uh, the one there is basically, so most BSDs have this thing where they tr um, offer additional binary support. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and up until a couple of years ago, OpenBSD had support for Linux. What that means is you can have a Linux compiled binary, you would run it on FreeBSD, and it would just run. Not just, because you have to set up like an environment, but by and large, the binary would work. Um, and it can do other things like, uh, you know, emulate a 32 bit environment of the 64 bit version of, of, of that BSD you have, um, and it can do uh, um, like older versions of the OS, things like that. Um, and the way that works is basically what they do is they emulate a whole bunch of system calls. They fake as the system call that you expect it to be and then they sort of funnel it to the real system call and then sort of, you know, parse the stuff back and forth. Um, they, uh, now, uh, um, combat layers are a great idea from a, a user functionality perspective. They are an absolutely terrible idea from a security perspective. 
Um, and uh, Theo Drat, who is the, you know, the leader of, of OpenBSD and, and you know, a pretty get, damn good developer, um, you know, had some really interesting insight about compat layers. And if anybody would know, it would be him. He goes, well, you know, people who rely on this stuff don't care enough to maintain it. And the people who work on the actual kernel uh, don't give a damn about the compat layers because they don't use them. Um, he says cultures are underlined in the same direction. And then he says compat layers rot very quickly, which means you write one today and tomorrow it's going to be just useless and just have nothing but security bugs in it. Um, so here's the, uh, um, here's a NetBSD. Um, this is, it's this like SVR4, which is like fairly ancient Unix y thing. Um, and they basically emulate that on NetBSD. So if you have an original binary compiled for that and you move the binary to NetBSD, it'll still work. And it has this thing called streams, which is the, sort of a predecessor to sockets ish. Um, and so what they do is NetBSD doesn't support streams, so what they do is they fake it and they sort of put a socket underneath. Um, and so the, the original SQR binaries will then think they have a stream even though it's a socket. Um, and so this thing basically it's, it's essentially, uh, um, it's essentially an octal that's supposed to do a socket operation. Um, and they cop in some data structure and they put in this BND structure and they pass it on to this net adder to sock adder in. And net adder to sock adder in basically looks at this uh, structure and says, oh, this thing contains a, a, you know, a 32 bit offset inside the structure. I'm going to use this offset and I'm going to add it to my pointer and I'm going to give you back a pointer to where you can start reading from. Um, problem there being is there is absolutely um, no validation being performed. Um, and so basically you can end up with a wild pointer that points anywhere, um, which you can either use to trigger uh, kernel panic, you know, your box goes down, or you can, if, if you know what you're doing, very selectively pick pieces of memory and start leaking, you know, very select pieces of, of kernel memory. Um, and then what's really beautiful is at the top of this file, someone said, well, we're going to pretend we have streams, we don't really, oh yeah, and by the way, this code's really gross. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was found in uh, uh, NetBSD M.1, but this thing's been around for uh, uh, 21 years. Uh, it's been there since NetBSD 1.2. It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and it, it gives you the ability to read arbitrary-ish kernel memory or cause kernel panic. And so I submitted this bug to the uh, NetBSD guys, uh, and they go, oh shit, yeah, this thing, this thing is a total, total piece of shit. And they go, uh, we, fix, we fix a gazillion bugs in this SVR4 thing. Uh, we should have never enabled this by default. It is an absolute minefield. Um, and so when I submitted the bugs and they fixed them, they also changed uh, their OS config file and, be like, and, and basically turn off SVR4 support. Um, if you want it now, you're going to have to recompile your kernel. <laughs> Okay, so another thing I was thinking, I was like, okay, well, okay, we have these things called trap handlers, and um, this is where things get a little bit exotic. Um, so trap handlers are these, these sort of callbacks that you register, that like very low level OS code registers sort of when it boots up, and it goes, uh, basically goes to the OS, or the OS basically sets these things up, and so when some kind of a hardware thing happens, these things get called, right? Some kind of an exceptional fault happens, and these are things like division by zero, a system call, a breakpoint, invalid memory access. Um, when, it, when the hardware sees any of these things, it sort of goes, oh, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to call this function pointer, and we'll have that deal with it, right? Um, some of them can be triggered by user land, some of them can be triggered by kernel, um, and the kernel has to trigger them correctly. Um, the thing with trap handlers is that they are unbelievably nasty pieces of code um, and exceptionally architecture specific. Every architecture and like every little minuscule like little diff will have, between architectures things are very different and then every little diff within architecture might still have like tiny little changes between them. Um, it's an absolute pain to try and understand these things um, and it is, it's ridiculously painful to look at this code. So I didn't look at it. Um, so I said, okay, but I'd still like to play with this a little bit. Where do I go from here? And I was like, okay, well, what can I do to trigger um, uh, uh, exceptions and, and faults? Well, what if I just start executing random instructions? What happens? Um, surely that'll trigger a bunch of uh, 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 exceptions and traps and then the US has to handle it. And then I have a slightly more um, bigger fuzzer. This is essentially it. This is a, a sort of a one slide, um, sort of uh, uh, trap handler fuzzer, where essentially what you do is you map a piece of code, read, write, or executable, you sort of start a loop, and every time you get in the loop, you basically, you know, read out of def you random, uh, a page of random garbage, 
you fork off a process, you hand that page to the process, and the process basically goes function pointer call, and then surely it crashes, and it does this over and over and over and over and over again. Um, <laughs> and essentially, I did this on FreeBSD, and you know, there's a, a extend trap that kind of blows up my face, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some other signal stuff that uh, um, sort of blows up. And I have a demo of this. I'm not sure if it's going to work because this thing sometimes blows up fast and sometimes it takes a while. But I can at least um, I can at least try and, and show this thing. Ah oh, man, it's so horrible. Ah, oh, god damn it! I got him. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Well, wow, look at that. This is uh, this is a horrible setup I got here. <laughs> and plus, my eyesight sucks. Um, so this basically forms off of positive processes. I don't know if it'll. Uh, I may have to come back to it later because, um, give it a few minutes, it might die. Um, so these are all crashes of that second thread, but without anything. Yeah, this has this doesn't crash the kernel yet, but eventually it'll it'll crash the kernel. Um, if we're lucky, fingers crossed. Um, I got it to hit earlier this morning, um, and usually it only takes a couple of minutes, but. It's like random garbage, so it's like. How are you recording which values cross traffic? Uh, so, not in this version, but I have a version that basically uh, has a UDP socket and sends it to a server. And so the server basically goes and says, okay, this is, this is the garbage you generate, this is the garbage you generate. And so when it crashes, I look at the last packet and I go, like, okay, let's decode what this set of, set of bytes are. Like, you can feed it to like IDA or something, and it'll tell you this is what it means. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll get back to this later. I hope it dies. <laughs> um, but essentially, so yeah, there's a, 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 a send trap that I hit, and then there was another send signal trap that I hit, which is this one. Um, and so hopefully, I, c I can show this uh, uh, in a little while. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on to file systems. Um, so obviously when you think file systems, you say, okay, well, you have a file system image and you can mount it, and obviously if you, or, or, you know, or have a USB stick and plug it in and have that mounted, and if somebody doesn't parse the file system correctly, then, you know, bugs show up, right? That is number one, that is an easy attack surface. Um, there's another one that I sort of, well, I was playing with and I was like, okay, that could be interesting. So in the last couple of years, all three of the BSDs have built in support for Fuse. Um, and I don't know if you guys know what Fuse is, but Fuse is essentially this a mechanism that allows you to have user land file systems. And the idea being there is that, you know, writing file systems in kernel is really, really hard. Um, and so if we move to user land, it's okay if your file system does something bad or crashes, the OS won't go down. Um, and so what that requires is um, your normal BSD uh, VFS layer now has to support a file system that's in user as opposed to one in kernel. Um, if you're talking, if kernel to kernel is talking, everyone's trusted. If kernel to user is talking, they're not trusted. So you're now taking this layer that it's always talked to someone that it's trusted, and you're basically now feeding it a bunch of data from user land that's no longer trusted. Um, so the VFS layer, VFS layers in theory, should have been hardened um, for Fuse. Um, so I looked at Fuse for all three BSDs, and basically, sort of my impression was that an BSD. Who's in, did their, this is funny, right? So all the, their family, right? They all forked from each other, except when Fuse came around, they all said, no, we're all gonna sort of make our own little thing. And so you have three distinct uh, Fuse implementations for the three different uh, BSDs. Um, and so NetBSD sort of, um, in my view, made the most complete implementation, which allows sort of for the most options and flexibility. Um, FreeBSD, I think, has the most controlled one in terms of um, the amount of stuff they'll take from userland in terms of a file system is highly controlled. Um, 
And so what that means is there's relatively little opportunity uh, for consumers to make mistakes, but there's more opportunity for the parsing inside the fuse code itself to make mistakes. Um, and then um, OpenBSD sort of um, uh, has sort of this minimal implementation. I mean, they all, uh, um, none of them implement IRTL, but they implement all of the other uh, file operations. Um, damn, I'm going to have to skip through this because I've got only a few more minutes left, I think, and there's conclusions I want to get to. Um, but anyway, this is the get CW system call um, for um, uh, for the BSDs, <coughs> uh, for OpenBSD, and that you can hit that from from views. Um, anyway, let's let, let's skip over to file some stuff. Yeah, the network is interesting. You know, there's some bugs in the networks in the network stack where if you send the packet, the box goes down. Um, blah blah. Oh, and this is one of these things where there's all, the, all these uh, wireless drivers that have like these straight straight up heap smashes where they're not expecting a malicious radio, uh, even though they're taking data over over USB. And so if you have a malicious, uh, a malicious radio, all of a sudden the OS has all sorts of heap overflows. Uh, but let's skip through that through. Right, there's some miscellaneous stuff I want to talk about, but I don't have time. <laughs> um, what? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, results. Um, I looked at this stuff for about uh, three months. Um, uh, I found about 30 or so bucks in FreeBSD, uh, 25 or so in OpenBSD, 60-ish in that BSD. And it's thing is, it's hard to because I, I gave approximate numbers because some of these things are like it's a single function and it contains five buffer overflows. Okay, is that one bug or five? Right. It's so I try to sort of be like, it's this many. Um, depends how you make, uh, how you sort of look at these things, but I think these numbers more or less make sense. Um, in terms of bugs I've seen, it's like a very long list of, I mean, there's the straight heap and, and stack smash like in those wireless drivers. Uh, a couple of race conditions, expired pointers, double freeze, recursion bugs, <laughs> integer issues, um, very, very interesting ref count issues. Um, obviously overflows, but also there was one uh, NetBSD bug where they're like, okay, we'll take a ref count on this V node and then Okay, we're going to take the mount point out, and then we're going to drop ref count. And now we're going to play with the mount point. Well, there's nothing tying them together, so if the mount point goes away. You're, hit, you're hitting wild pointers. Anyway, other things that I found were info leaks, out of mount leaks, null refs, logic bugs, um, a typo where they literally called the wrong destructor. It was something, something, something TX, and they called it something, something RX. Um, division by zero bugs, uh, kernel panics, and memory leaks. So. Um, <clears throat> Found bugs in all three, um, and basically, you know, in, in the attack surface I discovered, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, and sort of among the range of the bugs that I that I just listed, um, winner loser is is in my impression fairly easy. When I start looking at this stuff, OpenBSD came out as a clear winner um, for a number of reasons. Um, they have massively, massively uh, reduced their attack surface. Um, they got rid of global module support. They uh, um, have relatively few devices. Um, <laughs> got rid of all of their compat code, including Linux. Uh, they deleted their Bluetooth stack because it sucked. Um, they have more. They have more than 200, system, 200 less system calls than FreeBSD, um, and they cut support for a bunch of really shitty architectures. Um, on top of that, um, when TO said they care about code quality, they do. Um, they have virtually no integer overflows or sinus bugs. They're as good as gone in most places. Except the ones where they didn't know about the attack service, like the wireless drivers. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and then also very few info leaks. So the bugs they know about and the patterns that they know, um, they look for them, you know, like a madman and, and they eradicate them. Um, NetBSD is one of these where it's like, okay, comparatively, they're the clear loser. Um, tons of legacy code and compact code. So that's, you got attack surface right there. Um, <clears throat> they seem to be less consistent. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, code quality, and too many sinus bugs, and I know how this sounds, but and I'm not trying to diss them because I know it's incredibly hard to write an OS, right? If you think it's easy to build, maintain, improve an operating system, you should try it. It's really hard; like you will cry yourself to sleep. <laughs> um, and then somewhere in the middle is free BSD. Um, now, when I start reporting these bugs, um, sort of here's the response I got, right? When I emailed the OpenBSD guys. Uh, took about a week or so to get a mail back from TO. And for, he's like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, it took a week. I was out on vacation. 
And then within, you know, after that week, like bugs start rolling out, bug fixes start rolling out, you know, uh, the next couple of days. Everything got fixed within a two week period. Um, FreeBSD guys responded as well um, in uh, uh, about a week or so. And then five total bugs, I don't know the exact status of the bugs. Uh, NetBSD, and this is where they really shine though. Um, so I was kind of a lazy bastard um, and I was sort of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, procrastinating and I was like, oh, I don't want to write up all these 60 bugs. So I did only got them written up right before I got to Vegas. And so I sent him these bugs a couple of days ago, <laughs> which is really unfair of me. And I was thinking like, oh, how am I gonna deal with this? I don't wanna like make him look bad. Um, and then something happened that was like ridiculous. Um, they fixed all 60 bugs overnight. Which is unbelievably impressive. And I told him that. And I, I told him, like, if you want to call me out on being an asshole, you can. But I am in awe of you guys, because that is insane. Um, additionally, they also turned off SVR4, which I think is a great deal. And when they emailed me back, they said, we've disabled this thing, something we should have done a very, very long time ago. Um, so, yeah, pretty much, and, and, and my slides, more inclusions. Bugs are still easy to find. Uh, various, le various levels of quality. Uh, most consistent uh, was OpenBSD. Um, yeah, one more point I want to make is uh, many of the BSDs should talk to each other because I had several bugs where one guy had the bug and then the other guy fixed it like six months ago, right? And it goes both ways, right? It's OpenBSD and NetBSD and FreeBSD. Um, and uh, I got another funny story, funny story about that about a guy I met at a bar yesterday who was a former OpenBSD developer, but I don't have the time to get into it. Um, yeah, code bases is OpenBSD is the smallest, FreeBSD is the biggest, and so it's interesting to look at these things. Uh, it's clear OpenBSD has the least amount of tax rooms, FreeBSD likely has the biggest one. Um, this obviously plays a part, you know, if you, if you don't have code for something then you can't have bugs in it, right? <laughs> and there's a thing between accidental versus plant, right? Uh, some things didn't get, act, get, get implemented just so you didn't get to it, and other things you made a conscious choice to sort of get rid of it. Um, so yeah, the mini eyeballs thing, I think it's a factor. Um, Based on my results, I, I think it matters. I think code quality alone doesn't account for a discrepancy. I think code quality has something to do, uh, I think the, the mini eyeballs thing has something to do with it. Uh, my, my view is that, you know, say what you will about the guys looking at the Linux kernel, and you can say a lot about them, um, there are just simply so many more of them, and it shows in the numbers. Um, yeah, and then this thing leaked, this thing sort of the presentation got out before I did this thing, and. So the internet saw this and they, you know, had some questions and, and, and I, don't, I pretty much out of time, but I want to, because somebody asked about uh, um, Dragonfly BSD and I did not look at Dragonfly BSD, I considered it. Uh, maybe I should have, I just didn't, I ran out of time. Um, and then some links and then that's pretty much it. I think I'm out of time, right? <laughs> awesome.